Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Again, it's good to be able to join you today for this period of Bible study. In today's lesson, we're going to be discussing a topic which has often been discussed for many years, and that is over instrumental music. Many churches have been divided over whether we should use the instruments in our worship or not. Today, very few people are really very concerned about it. Virtually all religious groups use uh, instruments or at least they do not oppose them. And most people assume that churches have always had music, but of course that is not true. In the in history of the church, we know that in the first century, there was no instruments. And for many centuries after that, no church used an instrument in their worship to God. However, of course, now most all churches do use the instrument. And most people no longer even oppose them at all. Now, what does the scripture say about that? It doesn't matter what we might think. Most people would think it doesn't really make any difference. But again, we're not concerned with what man thinks. We're concerned with what the Bible says. And that's what we should always be concerned with, is what does the Bible say about any subject? The cornerstone verse regarding this, and and many other subjects for that matter, It's really Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. That verse simply says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice it says, whatever you do. And the world you're talking about it or actually doing something, whatever you do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means to do it by the authority of Christ. This verse tells us to respect the authority of Christ in everything that we do. This certainly would apply to our worship assemblies. The principle is basically this. When God has told us what to do and how to do it, then we must be willing to do just what he said in the way that God said to do it. Now, we have a lot of problem doing that in the name of religion. Now, we understand the importance of that principle in every other area. For example, many women and men, when they do cooking, uh, they use recipes. And let's say, for instance, you're cooking something and the recipe calls for four eggs. Well, if you decide to change it and use two eggs, obviously that's a a change, isn't it? You did not follow the recipe. Even though the recipe did not say you cannot use anything else other than four eggs, when it specified four eggs, then obviously to use anything else, would be changing the taste and obviously, I mean, changing the recipe and obviously would change the taste. We receive wedding invitations. Wedding invitations states the particular date and the time that the the wedding will take place. Obviously, this rules out any other day and any other time. It doesn't have to say, do not come any other day because this is only the day that we will have the wedding. Now, obviously, when you state the date and time, that rules out everything else. Well, the same is true in religion. The same is true in regards to the Bible. For instance, God told Noah to build an ark. He told him to build an ark of gopher wood, had to pitch it within and without, He told him the exact measurements of the ark, how many stories to have, how many windows, how many doors, and exact size and so forth. Told him how many animals to bring into the ark. And it says in Genesis 6, 6 and 22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah did exactly as God told him to. 
any changes would have been disobedience and Noah would have paid the price. We recognize that fact in regards to communion, for instance. In Matthew 26, Jesus instituted the communion and said to use bread and or bread and unleavened bread, excuse me, and the fruit of the vine. I don't know of hardly anyone who will try to say that we're free to use something else just as well. Almost everyone who believes the Bible at all uses unleavened bread and fruit of the vine in their communion whenever they partake of it. Few people would argue that cake and Coca-Cola, for instance, would work just as well. Coca-Cola has nearly the same color as grape juice. And of course, why does it have to be unleavened bread? I mean, it doesn't taste very good, does it? At least not to me. We might want to put something else on it. Suppose I want to put peanut butter on the unleavened bread. I love peanut butter. And so I, I think it would make the taste a lot better to put a little peanut butter on the unleavened bread. But again, I don't know of anyone that would argue that would be just as well. Even though you're using the same thing, you're just adding something to make it taste a little better. People realize that's going against what Jesus had said. That's going against what Jesus had intended. And I don't know of anyone who would try to justify that. But somehow, when it comes to instrumental music, we think it doesn't really matter. Even though the Bible only authorizes singing. The Bible only authorizes singing in our worship. There's two main verses that we're going to mention in regards to this. One, of course, is Ephesians 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Here, this verse tells us the purpose of singing. We are speaking to ourselves. We are speaking to one another. The only way we can speak to one another is by words. And it tells us the kind of songs that we are to sing. We are to sing the psalms or hymns and spiritual songs. Songs with spiritual meanings to it. We are not free to use any kind of song that we might want just because we happen to like it. We must sing spiritual songs, sing songs that teach one another spiritually or give honor and glory to God. We are to sing and then we are to make melody in our heart to the Lord. Now, some people tried to ostracize the, the use of the instrument by the words making melody. The Greek word here means solo, and many people would try to say uh, that means to pluck or st uh, the strings off an instrument. And throughout the history of that word, it did, or at least it could have that meaning. It could mean that we are to pluck or the strings off an instrument. But it's changed its meaning over the time. Since the first century, it changed its meaning, and so... Uh, in my, and as it's translated, it means to make melody. But even if you that was supposed to pluck the strings of something, you have to specify the instrument that you're going to solo or to pluck the strings on. And the instrument that is specified in this verse is the heart. We are to make melody in our heart. Many years ago, I heard a preacher from a Baptist denomination make the statement that you cannot solo without the use of the instrument. Well, did he not realize that his own denomination opposed the use of the instrument for many, many years? You see, if that was true, then why did not Paul and the other church use the instrument? Did Paul, who wrote this, did not understand what he meant when he said we need to make melody or we need to solo in our heart to the Lord? We know the first century church did not use the instrument. Surely Paul, who wrote this verse, would understand what he was trying to say. And if solo wasn't intended to include the instrument, then why did not the early church include it? And why did Paul not make sure the early church did include it? 
As I said, the instrument specified here is not the instrument or mechanical instrument, but it is the heart. It emphasizes the spiritual worship of the New Testament in contrast to the physical worship of the Old Testament. The other key verse in regards to the use of instrumental music is found in Colossians 3 and verse 16, and it speaks much the same wording as Ephesians 5, 19. That verse says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Notice again the emphasis. The emphasis is upon the spiritual aspect of our worship. We are to teach one another and admonish one another. How? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, how do you teach? The only way we can teach one another is by words. If I was to get on this TV program and just simply hum a tune, then I would not be teaching you at all. You would not learn a thing from me. Now, you might enjoy the music. You might enjoy listening to the humming or the music, whatever I might be doing, but you would not be learning anything at all. The only way I could teach you is by words. And so we are to teach one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, again, singing with grace for in our hearts to the Lord. Again, the instrument mentioned is the heart. There's 13 verses in the New Testament that refers to singing in connection with worship. The only music, music mentioned in connection with worship is vocal music. Now, instruments are mentioned in the New Testament. Matter of fact, they're mentioned something like 44 times. It's mentioned in connection with funerals, Instruments are mentioned in connection with pleasure, but never with worship except in Revelation. And of course, Revelation is written in, in symbols. So in Revelation, when it talks about music being in heaven, well, that's not talking about literal harps or anything else, but it's talking about the worship that we will be doing in heaven with God. The only authority for music in the New Testament is singing. We must sing in worship in the name of Christ. And we can do that because it was authorized. But we cannot play an instrument in the name of Christ because Christ did not authorize it. The instrument that we find is authorized is our heart. We must play our hearts. We must pluck the strings of our hearts, so to speak, in our worship to God, which means that we must be involved in our worship, thinking about the purpose of it, thinking about the words that we are singing, so that we, our hearts are involved in our worship to God. Now, some people will say, well, we have just as much authority for the piano or an instrument as we do a church building or songbook, because after all, church buildings are never mentioned in the New Testament. Songbooks are never mentioned in the New Testament, and yet we all use buildings and songbooks. So if we can use instruments, I mean buildings and songbooks, then we can use the instrument just as well. But that's not really true either. We are commanded to assemble for worship. Now, obviously, when we assemble, that involves a place. It might be a building you can rent or you can buy a building. It might be under a tree. It might be in a house. But you have to assemble somewhere. That involves some type of place. We are commanded to sing. That involves songbooks because songbooks, knowing the words of songs, help you to sing. But the instrument is not just an aid to singing. It is another kind of music, completely distinct from singing. Songbooks makes no sound whatsoever. They're simply an aid to singing. But instruments makes a sound. It is not just an aid. It is an addition. You see, no one ever accepted the instrument because after long hours of study, he concluded that it was God's plan and that it was required. I don't know of anyone who ever says that. 
It was adopted because it fitted comfortably into a religious style of our choosing. In other words, we use the instrument because we like it, or we want to be like everybody else. But this is appealing to the fleshly side of man. Even though you as an individual do not oppose or support using instrumental music, if you worship with a church that does use the instrument, then you are supporting its use. We need to be satisfied in doing just what God has authorized. There is no authority for an instrument in the New Testament. Pretty much everyone agree there is no real authority for it. Now, they might go on and try to say, but even though there is no authority, surely it's not wrong. But that's not the point. As we pointed out in Colossians 3, verse 17, at the very beginning of this lesson, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, by the authority of Christ. That means we must have authority for what we do in worship. There is no authority in the New Testament for the use of the instrument. That is why we do not use it in our worship. And I hope that would be why you would not use it in your worship to God either. May we simply be satisfied with doing just what God says in the way that he has said it. Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15, Arsredi Madurai, 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420, 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.